Hello world, my name is Tim Roswick, and welcome to a chat with Chris DeLeon uh, from Home Team Game Dev. Uh, we're going to talk about how to get stuff done, because Chris is a master at getting th stuff done, and I've learned a ton from him over the last couple of years. Uh, Chris, how you doing, dude? Uh, so yeah, so it's <laughs> doing complicated, <laughs> uh, but, but, but I will explain that, and that's actually relevant here, because uh, sometimes we're not doing great, uh, and part of what I have to find ways to focus on is how to do things anyway even when not all is well in the world, right? And, and this is something where uh, we say like a, a you know, productivity master. I think it's important to contextualize. I make video games, that's most of what I do, but I've also like, I've written multiple 500 page textbook things uh, with used by like 200,000 people, uh, finished multiple video courses, self-published. I've uh, started three different game development clubs over the past 15 years, uh, started two different businesses, bootstrapped with no outside funding, et cetera. Uh, and so like part of what for better or for worse I'm able to do is to make myself do a thing because I think it ought to be done. And afterwards I can, you know, can I make it worthwhile? Can I justify it? Can I sell it? Can I, can it fit in a bigger productivity picture or something? Um, and that means that whether or not I feel like it, that means whether or not like it's going well lately, um, I can keep things on the rails and that's been really helpful to me. And as a trainer who works with a lot of other people who want to learn game development, I figured out increasingly has been helpful to kind of separate from programming questions, design questions, art, music questions, whatever. There's a lot of people who they have access to resources online, tutorials, they've watched some videos, they know how to do some stuff. They want to do it and they're not. And this is actually a pretty generic problem even outside of games of like someone wants to, I don't know, take up a hobby doing pottery or something. They might know how to do it, but they're not doing it. And so having kind of tried to basically slice and dice for the past several years and read up on and study, that's actually a multi-thousand year old problem of like philosophers would tangle with like, why don't we do the stuff we mean to do? Why do we do things other than what we intend to do? Because it's like, it's like this missing step. We kind of assume that if I just know the right things, that if I have the right training or if I'm in the right position to do it, it's gonna happen. And then like years can go by and a lot of people find themselves like, I still haven't made a game. I still haven't released my album. I still haven't published my ebook. I still haven't started my podcast. And so like, you know, like, so the same thing if they've got a podcast going now, 130 episodes, been running this since like, I think past five years consistently where life ups and downs, stuff happens, keeps coming out consistently. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do in focusing on this current, like on an audio book I'm releasing soonish has been trying to articulate and lay out the ways of thinking around that, some simple kind of exercises that kind of help externalize our intentions, make clearer to ourselves what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it, how we evaluate if it was worth doing and so on. So let, let me break that down real quick. So what sure. do you think, I think there's the, there's the stuff that stops us, right? And then there's the, like the, I guess, will or energy or motivation or whatever to kind of push forward. What do you think are some of the things that stop us uh, before we even start? Yeah, well, so, and I think... It, you know, everything's always in a context. And quite often what's happening is by the time we are struggling to start, I actually think it's because of other times we have failed before. And even in little ways. And it comes up in these sort of things where uh, things like many, many years ago, I used to listen to a lot of Anthony Robbins stuff. Pros and cons, don't agree with everything this guy says. But he's got this great thing like, if you keep on telling yourself you're going to do something and you don't do it, you're going to stop trusting yourself, right? You're going to like basically feel like you're lying to yourself or it's like you don't take your words seriously. And I think often that's what happens where we keep wanting to do something. We tell ourselves, I'm going to do it on Tuesday. I'm going to get around to it this week uh, by the end of 2020 or whatever. And the time comes and goes. And I think we start to discourage ourselves to be like, you know, if you have that friend who keeps saying like, oh, I'm going to do this thing. And they never actually like start a band or whatever. You just stop taking them seriously. And it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah. cool, man. Good luck out there. But we do it to ourselves in a way we can't escape. We can't move away or like get a different roommate because it's us. And so that I think is one of the sources of it. And that actually gets tied up in a lot of the kind of, there's different components to it. There's kind of a direct series of actions we can do that kind of help, but there's also ways of thinking around it. Partly have to do with these things about how we have to be careful about what we assign ourselves in ways that we are setting ourselves up to like have a decent chance at it. And where this most often screws us up and it's why it affects so many game developers I work with is if we're in a domain that is outside of our training, is outside of what we have proper formal training in, uh, it's very difficult to gauge difficulty. It's very hard to tell what's easy or not in a way that there's some traditional fields, math, writing, 
we know what first grader work looks like. We know what third grade work looks like. We know what seventh and eighth and 12th grade work looks like. If we're just splashing around a field, we have no proper training in, no formal background, no mentorship in. It's super, super easy, terrifyingly easy to step into a black hole that we have no idea is like an unsolvable problem and then hate ourselves because we didn't do the thing that really no one can do. And our error there was like what we set ourselves up for, that we had committed ourselves to do this thing without having sort of the right mindset going into it of, you know, first of all, evaluating, is this possible to do right. for me at my skill level? Sounds obvious when you say it, but when you're missing that step is one of the many ways people kind of step in it in such a way that they kind of penalize themselves and start to get frustrated as to why haven't I finished my book yet? And like, maybe you're trying to do something going about it in a way that if you ask an expert about how they do it, you might figure out there's a very different process. There's a whole step missing. There's sort of a different level of uh, intensity or, or confidence they put into it. So we talked about in our video before this, let's all get strung together somehow. Uh, rapid prototyping being a lot of my area of expertise as a game developer, as a programmer, that even as someone who spent my entire career and most of my life doing this stuff, that doesn't mean I go into building a game with higher confidence that it's going to be great. I will make stuff with very low confidence of like, until I have some sort of retroactive hindsight validation from myself, from a mentor, from a peer, from audience of something, my assumption is all untested ideas are basically equally worthless until I have evidence otherwise. And so that's, it, it, that's it interesting. puts a very different level of pressure on myself to like, oh, I got to do something brilliant. And even this something, I've got plenty of peers out of my many years of networking and game developers who've gotten these, gotten themselves in really tough corners. They had a successful game, and then they're in a very different headspace than where they were before they made that successful game. And and they're very much bound up over like, oh, my next thing's got to be amazing. My next thing's got to right. be like, it's got to exceed that somehow. And that was not where they were at when they went into building that. That's not the yeah. level of like showing, proving themselves. I'm going to you know show everyone that they're wrong was where that other thing came out of. Some people get in that mindset about other people's things. Like yeah. that guy made Stardew Valley. So my game's got to be better than that you know like yeah yeah so, uh yeah i'm curious like okay so when when you're talking about these barriers and like there are things that stop us before we even start and like you said uh, it, you can actually start to look at yourself as a liar i say i'm gonna do this thing i don't do this thing so my word really doesn't mean anything do you think there are ways that we could improve that because for just for example one of the ways that i've realized that about myself because i've done that my entire life and i did i stopped trusting myself um i started announcing my stuff online on the internet like i would my release date for my game um the the different things that i'm gonna do and then that sort of like helps me i don't know if that's the healthiest way to do it because i feel like i maybe i got some stuff to work on but like at least now like that social pressure is kind of more pushes me more than like it would normally yeah so there, there's several things in there one is the deadline um and it's a thing that like we can almost write off as like so obvious deadlines help they're productive whatever uh i'm reminded of like college campuses and businesses use whiteboards and cork boards because they work like no matter how simple it seems if you don't have it stuff isn't getting done if you have it it helps deadlines are one of the things we take for granted are you know it's not just arbitrary and part of why the deadlines are so important for all of the game development clubs I've run, which have released hundreds of games since 2004, all of these clubs, mostly like amateurs building games together, deadlines have always been part of it. The moment they pitch, they say, my game is coming out December 3rd. They say, my game is coming out March 15th. They say, my game is coming out whatever. And part of how that works isn't that they are trying to predict the future or guess. It's that they're saying, I am going to release what I can do with this idea by March 13th or by December 3rd or whatever. And this is something where so many ideas are squishy. As long as you're not at a total beginner struggling level, and that's a different story. If you're like, I can't get my code to compile. I can't, I have no idea how long it's going to take to make something just like a character jump. You got to check those boxes first. Once you're past some basic fluency of you can do some things, you know, you can add a feature in a given week. Then it becomes this thing where, uh, I think for a while ago on Twitter, there was some like illustrated viral video about some guy drawing Spider-Man in five seconds and in five minutes. And like five hours and you can do it you're going to do it differently one is a sketch one is like a little better and one is wow the expertise really shines here and so that's something that again like giving yourself a timeline and saying this is the amount of time this is worth to me we'll often break those down in our clubs too is like on a weekly schedule where we just say all right this is the week we're giving ourselves to sort out 
AI or icons or whatever. And what that means is we're going to move forward on whatever the state of it is by the end of that week. And hopefully we can do better with it. Hopefully we can do nice with it. We can make some concrete trade-offs about like, this could use another cycle. We're going to trade that for something else later in the schedule. But it's so much more tangible than one mega deadline. This is one of the things too that I think people take for granted. Even that idea that all I'm going to focus on is just a final deadline is really something that in our formal schooling system for all its faults and it's far from perfect for all its faults reflects a lot of iteration like thousands of years of human society progressing that's really something that like literally phd level students is where we start to entrust them to be like get a thing done by like four years from now sort it out for everybody else including like master's students there's usually quite a bit more structure in terms of all right i need your rough draft by this date i need to see three versions by then We'll have a separate meeting about this other thing. And that structure, we like we hate meetings and we hate structure. We hate social accountability. They very much play a functional role in most of our lives. And I think acknowledging that those can be useful to us is very valuable. Um, but you're interested in like announcing stuff. And there's a way that you do it that I think is subtly different from what some other people do. Because you'll be like, you know, you want them to be aware of it. You like to get some social, you got a healthy social accountability factor with your audience. Sometimes what happens, and this can, I think, blow up on people is they all have failed to do a thing. Uh, and so we have, this happens in our club, for example. So people, will, some weeks will pass, life got complicated. They didn't, they weren't involved for a little bit. They kind of essentially missed class, missed school, missed work, whatever metaphor. They'll show up at a meeting and be like, I'm going to do so much next week to make up for it. No, no, that always blows up on them. Uh, and and the reason why, right, is that I use the example out of my, uh, the audio book that, okay, let's say, we're going to do like snail's pace. I just, I want to write a short story or a book or something. I'm not going to try to even like not a Ramo pretty ambitious. I'm going to try like one page a day is my goal. And this next week I'm going to write five pages. If Monday and Tuesday pass and I didn't write pages at all. Cause like, I don't know, stuff happened, life, stressed, low energy, whatever. And my thinking is Wednesday. I'm going to do three times as much as what I had no time to do the previous two days to make up for it is pure fiction. And it increases the pressure on us the longer we expect to make up for that lost time. Because again, we couldn't even do one page a day. Right. But in our brains, we're like, oh, I'm going to play catch up and do three in a day. Uh, now you're in a bind. And that only gets worse. And with that gets us more stressed and less able to do it. And you turn you turn a, a, a late start into an exit point, right? Yeah. You just quit because it gets, it, at no. some point it gets overwhelming yeah and a lot of what i've tried a lot of my professional areas of trainers have essentially been figure out why do people quit making games and give up on it when they were so into it when they cared so much to do it when it's so important to them and helping if nothing else uh preempt some things that are early paths down that road and have figured out a bunch of the same things apply to other areas of life of like wanted to play music wanted to become a right. wanted to get more involved in dance scene or something the same stuff really applies in terms of like why and how we build up too much pressure on ourselves versus realizing that no matter when we come back to it after a break, we still got to start slow. Yeah. We still got to warm up. That's the story of my life, dude. I, I, a big example and a small example. The big example is uh, I made games when I was in high school. I loved making games. It was it was a bunch of stuff. I spent all my time making stuff. And then it came to picking a career and I was like, everybody says I need to get a real job. And if I make games, it obviously has to be a job, which means it has to pay my bills. I don't think I could ever make games to pay my bills, so I guess I can't make games. And then I stopped making games for 10 years. And just because I built up all this imaginary pressure on like what this thing was when I could have just did it anyway or like not right. put that pressure on the thing. And then also like with my YouTube channel, um, there was a while back where it just got overwhelming and I stopped, I stopped doing it. And uh, then for every month that goes by, it's like... Oh, now I got to post a good video because it's been a month. And then that, right. and I did daily videos before and it's been three months. And now, and what got me over it was like, okay, I'm going to post the crappiest video I can. I just, I just yeah. push it out Get and pretend like nothing happened. <laughs> yeah. Just like do yeah. And I got those comments. They're like, Tim, where you been? But then like, they were not like angry. They were like happy. Like, thank yeah. you for posting yeah. something. Well, and, and, and again, it's where, you know, it's somewhat semi depends on the context. Obviously if we screw off on our job and don't go for several months and we show up, they're going to be like, you're so fired, obviously. But as long as what you're doing is in a community that's supportive, whether it's because your fans are essentially friends um, in our learning communities where it's people know, like we're here to practice. We're all here because we've struggled before, etc. It's much more like uh, we kind of use the level of pressure. We kind of liken to pick up soccer, pick up football, pick up basketball, People just show up on the weekend, play volleyball together, whatever. And like, if Tim isn't there one week, 
You're just like, oh, I hope Tim's okay. Man, you're not mad at him. You're not upset at the person. You're not right. angry. You're not going after him. You're like, I hope I see him next week. And whenever they come back, you're like, oh, I'm so glad you're back here. And they're not stressed about the fact like you weren't around for a little bit. They just want you plugged back in and doing it. And that really is much more the energy a lot of communities, a lot of people, a lot of learners, a lot of peers have as to they just yeah. want you back. They're not angry about it. For me personally, I know like being an introvert at heart, like when I when I do something wrong and I feel like I mess up socially, my first reaction is to isolate completely and just like ghost everybody and then just disappear completely because it's, it's way easier to do that than like deal with the problem. Uh, and I've realized that's, I, I see a lot of people that do that and that's probably like the worst thing that you can do. Like the, yeah. you know, cause that like, that makes, that makes what nobody even realized was a problem into like a bigger thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And this is the huge dynamic and uh, I work with a lot of different teams that have this challenge, not just, uh, also in some things I do with organizing some festivals and other stuff where there's people who are really, really, really good at what they do, but they have that particular problem of if something is out of sorts, they miss a meeting, they skip an email, if something's out of sorts, right. they disappear, which is the worst thing to do. And it's, it's, it's one of these things where uh, part of learning to be on teams, which is also kind of one of the things I'll, I focus on a lot of my work, is like learning to surface. If there's a problem, the problem is hiding it. Like as soon as you surface to others, like, hey, y'all, there's a lot going on. I'm going to be slow or not around the next few weeks. That's fine. People can plan around that. We can plan some detours. We can be aware of it. We respect it. Get well soon. Take care of your family. Whatever's going on, life is real. Uh, but if we have no idea and can't reach you, even to have somebody like, are you alive? Is this okay at all? Do, are you mad at us? Makes an enormous difference. And I've had, when I used to make iPhone games uh, with some subcontractors and stuff, some subcontractors like that are supposed to deliver some AI code, just like didn't respond to email. And every day that they wouldn't, would get worse and then they'd feel like oh i can't be in touch until i have like a finished system which again is back to this thing of like well if you couldn't do one page a day on these two days you're not suddenly doing three times as much then you backed yourself into a corner versus if they just been like oh, i need some extra time or like here's what i got so far can we talk about that might have unblocked them and avoided that bad ending where they kind of quit that kind of work you brought back so many nightmares to contractors. That is that is the thing I hate so much. When I hire somebody to do something and they ghost you, like literally, liter keep the money, okay? Keep the deposit. Just please tell me you can't do it so I can find yeah. someone else to do it. That's yeah, the I'll worst I'll thing accept. you can possibly do. Like, I'll accept I bet on the wrong horse. Yes. But just set me free just, so I know I can yeah. allocate my efforts so not have my hopes up or whatever. And it, it, you know, it's interesting because especially like a lot of a lot of people will will join teams and stuff with indie games with people they don't know or or things they don't work and that that scenario plays out in a lot of different ways where people just slowly disappear because it's a lot easier to disappear from the internet than your, yeah. your life right so it happens yeah. a lot in this i'm curious on one thing so i i like the public accountability thing for like my game dev stuff and all that but another thing that i realized which is the complete opposite that works really well for me is not telling anybody anything is not like in my own personal life if i'm gonna do something if i've got a goal like a weight loss goal or whatever like it is not saying a word about it and just right. doing it and just focusing on it do you think that's that's a good strategy too yeah i mean that certainly could be a thing i i'm real big on because a lot of what this tries to deal with is this this bizarre gap that we take for granted isn't there until we think about it and it gets very there between the world of stuff we talk about and the world of stuff that we're actually doing and those are two separate things, yeah. right? There's people who, from all verbal interactions, seem like really good people in their actions, just not that great in any measurable way, and vice versa. And uh, one of the things that can happen is we can wind up inhibiting ourselves from doing a thing because I feel like I've scratched that itch somehow by talking about it. And there is yeah. there's research, some genuine research out there, people can Google it, there's different work that's been done on this, that like talking about enormous goals, sharing those fantasies, in some ways reduces our likelihood of acting on them. Now, there's like there's a there's a there's a window of time in which it might be useful. If I'm like, oh uh Betty, I'll get you this by five, that doesn't have this problem. If what right. I tell you is like, I'm gonna be the number one Olympian and running next year, like that's such a crushing pressure. And I'm sure there's like three examples someone can find you from history and be like, well, what about this one? I'm like, all right, cool. What about the other hundred thousand people who made the same promise and just quit track and we're like Oh, that's a lot, right? Like that's that's not constructed that kind of pressure we put on ourselves sometimes. Um, and so a lot of it also does this mindset of uh, picking the long-term goals, not as thinking it's going to happen like that, 
but as a direction to move in. And I used the, I used the example thinking about like in theme park design, popularly like uh, Disney World does this thing where they have like a huge castle over there and they got the giant golf ball looking Epcot Center over there or whatever. And it's just a direction so your family can be like, ooh, let's go see what that is. And along the way, you might find something else cool and detour and you didn't fail. You didn't waste your time to go that way. It gave you a reason to, to pick a direction and not just spiral in a circle. I forget what those are called because I watched an entire presentation about how Disney designs their parks specifically with these gigantic set pieces to to direct the flow of and, traffic. And shopping malls do the same thing with their anchor yeah. stores. It's to like, well, we got to get to Dillard's and it's way at the end. And then along the way, let's stop in, you know, I'll say KB Toys because I'm a dinosaur. But like, yeah, it's it, it's the same sort of idea. So when we pick these long-term goals, the idea isn't I say... I, I really think I'm gonna like I'm unhappy if I don't become the AI engineer at Epic. The idea is that by striving for that in that direction, I'm more likely to discover some worthwhile pathways along the way and to not see it as failure if what I discover is like actually I'm really happy doing like some other kind of research as a programmer in the biology lab. Or I'm actually pretty right. happy working on this like whole genre of game that didn't exist when I started down that road and not to see that as like, ah, oh, my success criteria was getting exactly what was on the horizon as opposed to the goal was to get myself going that way. And so like with our club games, we do the same thing as to, our goal isn't to release the game we pitched. The goal is to release something that made that was worth doing in that time. And if we figure out 75% through it, it's like, actually, this is gonna be way cooler if we just kind of cut the story and make it an arcade game. Fine, cool. You wouldn't have got there if you didn't at least have enough clarity at the outset to get on the same direction. Yeah, that, that direction thing, it means a lot to me. Cause I think, I think it's a Tony Robbins quote that says like, most people underestimate what they do in a year, but or overestimate what they can do in a year, but underestimate what they can do in a decade. Just because like that yeah, yeah. daily type of direction, not even like I got to be the national Olympian by next year right. or whatever, but like I'm going to head that direction that gets you like things like daily practice and daily practice has, you know, that exponential kind of growth yep. over time that you didn't know was possible. Um, and it's, I think everything that I've done in my life has been the result of, knowing my direction, not knowing my goals, not knowing specific things, but knowing where I'm headed. And I think, what would you say to people that don't know their direction or they feel sure. lost? They don't know where yeah. they so, want to go with it. I mean, a couple of points that kind of come up in that audiobook. Like one of them has to do with, well, we worry sometimes about, will I find some use for this skill if I have it? Like, will I really do this? And one of the neat things about life is there's this classic thing, right? You give someone a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, once you have that skill set, of building websites or giving speeches or writing stories or whatever, you'll see all these opportunities that were invisible to you, but now you can't help but see because like, oh shoot, I can fix that problem for my church, for my school club, for my like wife or for my like whatever's going on in your life. Like it's another tool in your tool belt. And we start to see all these opportunities to like play guitar at the campfire because I can in a way that otherwise just like, I don't know, why would you play a guitar? When would you do it? Um, when you give yourself the skill, you start to see all these opportunities to do it in ways that otherwise you wouldn't notice. So some of it is just doing it. You find some stuff to do it with. Uh, a lot of it too is this thing where like part of the difficult thing that we kind of this method's built around, often when I'm working with people, they're very early in their skill sets. They're doing it when it still sucks. It's just not good to do. They're not fluent. They're not fast. They don't enjoy it. It's a lot of struggling. It's a lot of getting stuck and asking questions, that kind of thing. One of the things that happens is when you're good at something, kind of nearly regardless of what it is, it's more fun to do. I don't care if it's karate, making music, doing a vase, break dancing. You used to do that in high school, whatever. Like when you get good at it, it's kind of fun to do. It's satisfying. You feel good about the fact you're good at this thing other people aren't good at. But the only way you get there, obviously, is finding some way to push through that slog of this is unpleasant. I'm not good at this yet. This does not come naturally to me. Nearly nothing comes natural to anybody. Like you have to go through a while and you can figure out for you, is this worth like, oh, I'm gonna give this four months and if I'm still not feeling it, pivot. That's fine, that's okay. Um, part of, a lot of what I focus on too is externalizing our, at least intentions to ourselves to be able to decide, is this important enough to me I actually care to do it? Cause if not, that's okay to admit. Uh, I think sometimes we talk about this later between what we talk about and what we do, we get wrapped up in our head because of something our parents said at some point something some classmates said, something we saw on TV, this idea that really is disconnected from what we want to do. And sometimes we're struggling to do something because heart of hearts, deep down, we don't really want to do it. We're not that interested in what this is. And we get this kind of identity struggle about, like, oh, but I've talked about that and I've read magazines about that and I thought that was who I am. 
And if I'm not that, then who am I? And the weird th thing of it is, like, you can't figure that out until you let that go. It, it, it's like being in a, in a crummy relationship that, like, you don't want to be in in reality. But, like, well, you're not going to find another one if you're still in that, that one. Crummy as that sounds. Like, that's – you're that's focused so on true, this thing. Though, that, dude. Yeah. I, do, okay, this is kind of on a tangent, but, like, I'll never forget the day I got my Dodge Challenger, my shiny Dodge Challenger repossessed. Because, because up until that point, even though I had crazy financial problems, even though everything, like I was going to be homeless, my identity was tied to a muscle car. I was the guy who drove a muscle car. And when I lost that, it was like an identity crisis. Like if, if I don't have this, who am I? Yeah. And it was, it was unbearable at that point, but like, it was so, so freeing afterwards of like removing the thing that I've like just I, and I don't even know why it was that thing. I guess everybody has their own thing of what that becomes, right? Uh, I, I know, like, that people get caught up in titles and stuff. I'm a programmer. Yeah. I'm an artist or whatever, and then right. they kind of get locked in those things. But when you can remove those things from your life, and you can you can really realize, okay, I'm not what they say I am. I'm not, I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm me. I can yeah, be a collection of all of these things. I can have different skill sets. I don't have to be a marketer or a programmer right. or whatever, right? Like I can have marketing ability and be a creative yeah. person or whatever. Uh, I think it can open you up to kind of identify where you want to go with things or what yeah. you want to do. Cause there's a lot of social pressures that push us places. And a lot of For people sure. don't realize that. And I think sometimes that fear partly it comes from a fear of like, am I starting over? Do I, do I right. lose all the progress I've invested in this path? And quite often what ends up happening is that there's some sort of way to multi-class or to overlap them in the way of like, okay, I used to be mainly a programmer. Now I've started really focusing on art. Turns out there's a whole field of technical artists where I can combine those fluencies <laughs> to do things people on the other side can't. And there's a whole bunch of things where it's like, actually, okay, well, you know, you're a marketer, but you also, as part of that, are used to be able to like, build websites and stuff. That's a useful skill for all kinds of things that aren't that. You know, uh, when, when I quit, well, when I sold my marketing, I kind of quit marketing. And I was just like, I, I was so upset because like, I felt like I wasted 10 years of my life because I always wanted to make games, but I quit. And then over the last couple of years, I've realized that my my ability to market to someone is directly tied to my empathy to understand them, which happens to make me a fantastic designer because right. I, I have this like insight into someone's brain that I wouldn't have had, had I not spent 10 years trying to sell them shit. <laughs> well, Stuff. It, it, yeah. When they, this very, let me mark that time, a 9 PM, uh, very much the same point as to like, uh, even this idea that what you are doing should consider the person on the other side, sounds so obvious when you say it right for a lot of people out there and again it depends why they're doing it for a lot of them it's more about i want to express what's inside me and whoever wants it take it or leave it that's fine right. which like that's fine like that's my attitude for my instagram my family joked about like <laughs> hey what if you did some stories with those so they don't last forever or just don't post them at all and i was like no nah, i'm gonna post what i feel like and if people want to follow or not whatever that's my mm -hmm. attitude about it and some people have that attitude other people if they want to express it as a business it's helpful to be like yeah, who's looking at this? What do they want out of it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing, I think knowing your direction, knowing what you want out of things is really, really important because some people, like even, I get comments on YouTube too, like, um, how do I make a successful game? What does that mean? Yeah. What, successful in what? Do you want an award? Do you want a million dollars? Do you want somebody to just play it? Like, are you having yeah. trouble getting anybody to see it at all? Like, what? Where are you at on that? So I think identifying it helps too. Like, yeah, I, and, and I, I've made enough games over the years, including enough. I, I've had games played by 7 million people. I've made games that were very profitable. I've made games with big companies, small companies. I've also made games that like probably fewer than 100 or a few hundred people played, but like really affected those people. And they posted really lengthy responses and reviews about like how this changed the perspective on something, how much it meant to them, how much it spoke to them because it was so deeply niche in a way that like that game will win no awards. That game did not keep my business running longer or whatever but as a creative individual making stuff was very validating to me as like i'm really proud of having made that thing that was a successful thing to me in a different way not that there's anything wrong with other metrics of success that like they are not necessarily mutually exclusive but nor are they all on a single linear scale either so yeah you're totally right as to like okay what does success look like to you um and again what i like about this thing about okay the long distance target is to justify movement because you got to move if you're sitting still doesn't matter. You got to be moving. You might change your mind. You might have tried to make a thing to sell well, find out it's getting a lot of like 
awards from the art scene and showing in galleries and you're like, this is my life now. There's worse places to be, uh, even if it wasn't what you were setting out to do. But you wouldn't have got there if you hadn't at least first set a target and been like, that's where I'm going. I got a, I got a direction to move when I wake up, when yeah. I come home from work. And I think too, I think once you remove the stress and the pressure of that and you're moving a direction, like you said, it's okay to pivot. Like if you, you may discover something along your journey that completely shifts the way that you go. And if you're just aware of that and you're paying attention to it, um, and, you know, it can change. And, so, and a, a, a huge underlying sort of one of the mindset things in that, uh, and there's sort of a whole section that's out of the audiobook stuff, but I've mentioned before on my YouTube channel longer ago, is partly about the important distinction that whether or not something was the right idea has to be based on what you knew at that time. And, and, and I use the example of like, uh, okay, uh, if we've got kind of a minute for a micro story, we inherit some farm land and we have to decide we want to plant corn or wheat. And like one is better for a dry season, one's better for a wet season. And uh, we get the information from the experts that say like there's a 70% chance it's going to be really rainy. So, you know, plant the one for the wet season. And if they were, if the odds didn't work out that way, right? So we followed their advice and it turns out it was a dry season. Do we regret our decision? And like naturally our tendency is to be like, ah, oh, shoot, kicking myself. I should have done the other one. And the reality is like, no, for a bunch of reasons, you can only do what you had from the information you had at the time. If you could go back in time, you should make the same decision. If the same information comes up again, you should still make the same decision. Then you might find some different experts, maybe. But like all the time in life, we wind up kicking ourselves into this case of like, nothing means anything anymore. If we allow too many outside factors, too much randomness, too many odds of, maybe all things considered we did the right thing and it didn't work out we give up on the other yeah. hand i've also seen some people who really 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 lucked out i'm talking made some just really uh, by anyone's metric not cool stuff really profitable for one reason or another and left them in this weird spot in life where like they didn't know what to do next because they didn't know how they did that and they didn't know they didn't know why it was a good decision or what worked about it and there's kind of like floating out in space and so i think it's really helpful to distinguish at best you can do at the time that was the right direction to go and maybe I have new information and now there's a better yeah. direction to go, but I'm not mad at myself for having initially thought that seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because with philophobia, I have this shadow mechanic where it blocks everything out of your view range, right? And yeah, it's really striking in the screenshots. The yeah, videos. it looks great. It looks interesting. Yeah. And when I first made it, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And it's a game about suicide and hell and some dark things. So it, it fits thematically. And it's a precision platformer. Right. And I realize in retrospect, as a designer that's learned a bunch, that those two things actually conflict design-wise. Like, right. I'm covering the whole screen and making it hard to see where the platforms are, but you got to be precision in where you jump, right? Like, that mechanic right. actually would have worked out better for, like, a Metroidvania or some kind of exploration type of game. But I didn't know that. Sure. I made the best decision that I could at that time. I thought it was interesting. And you know what's interesting is, like, I for actually for a couple months, I actually looked at it and said, okay, that's a design flaw. It's a flaw in the game. It's looking back at it. It was a thing I did wrong. But you know, what's interesting is I talked to speedrunners now who speed run the game with crazy speeds. And, uh, because of that mechanic, it makes them me memorize. They have to memorize the entire layout of entire levels, which makes it much more difficult than most games. And a lot of them enjoy that challenge. Yeah. And that's something I never would have like, even thought about that something I, I literally look as a fail in the game like a, a flaw is could actually work out in a in a way that i never thought it was possible and exactly like you said it's not it's not wrong it's the best decision that i made at that time with that information and we forget that we we didn't have the same information we had back then. right so it, that's yeah. still valid and, and that's even again to go back to the when it kind of the only question about like how a lot of beginners get themselves trapped into like doing this thing that turns out is a super complex problem, but they didn't know that when they started trying to essentially let themselves off the hook to be like, I didn't know till I explored it, how infeasible that approach is. And that that is okay to be like, aha, this is not worth 10 years of effort to try to solve that. I'm either gonna shortcut around it, design around it, get rid of it, etc. cetera. Um, I think sometimes one of the things that happens is, uh, again, school system pros and cons, we're very used to the world will hand us a problem, our job, our teacher, and we are now on the hook to solve it. And we forget that when we're doing our own projects, when we're exploring our own skills, when we're training ourselves in something that we have no formal training or background in, we are not necessarily having problems automatically that are at our level, that are suited to us, that'll even move us in the direction we want to go if we haven't thought about where we're trying to get with it. And so I think it's very helpful to kind of take a moment and be like, you know, uh, there's this thing where my mom 
she would ask her teacher like in first grade like how do i spell gorilla and the teacher said a p e and i i like that solution because like quite often as a designer there's things where i have an idea i want to do and the engineer in me is like ooh, what about this instead and i'm like that'll do but like it comes from looking at the problem and being like is there some simpler answer that gets me where i want to go and is that fine in the bigger picture because it frees up the time to do something else or some other idea chris we need to talk more because i i spent the last eight months on a procedure generated game uh, I've been through 10 different procedural generation algorithms, and the one that I ended up with was pre-made content smashed together. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to revolutionize the procedural generated content, and then I realized that this is a much bigger problem than I thought it was, and there's a reason why pre-made content smashed together in little squares. But it was the right idea work. at the time. <laughs> it it yeah. was, I learned a lot, and I'm never going to make that mistake again, and, and I... I honestly, it made my end algorithm even better with yeah. all the different things because of and, all the mistakes we made. And, and there's a lot of richness in learning that, that again, I think sometimes uh, I've got uh, educator I used to work with named AJ, uh, used the idea of like snowplow parents, where some parents try to strategically keep their kids from experiencing any failures or mistakes or bad decisions in a way that the developing human being, adult to be, is not learning, you know, obviously you know, keep them safe, etc. I'm not trying to tell anyone to do otherwise. But it's just some things of like, hey, should you stop them from trying a thing that from your judgment as an adult is like, they're going to hate that. Let right. them find out they hate it. And so like, for me as a educator, a lot of what I actually do in our methodology is probably some rapid prototype or anyway, is I specifically steer people into some reasons why this technique does not scale. And it's very much like, hey, we're going to do it the simplest way we can for now because it's easiest to understand up until we hit about that fuzzy line of like, Ooh, it's going to take a different solution to do this. But when you learn it, it's so much richer in its connection to you and your ability to draw upon it. When you hit a problem and the more complex answer was necessary to take it to another level, then if it's just your professor being like, always do things this way, this right. is the right way. This is what Google wants to see from you. And it's like, all right, but now you're so slow because you don't know where the line is for if you need to do something fast or just to try it or just to see. And so, yeah, there's very much this thing as to like, let yourself make those mistakes and it gives you a deeper knowledge. If nothing else too, is if someone else now comes to you with questions about procedural generation, you'll have a much more interesting, yeah. rich answer for them than it would have been if you hadn't done that. Well, you know, one of the things that came out of that too was uh, realizing how intertwined the gameplay was with the actual map generation. And that's yeah. something I never even considered because I was just like, there's the map and then there's the game. But like going through all these different algorithms, I realized like, okay, the ones with big empty space are boring this game needs to be enclosed it's a stealth game you want that right. tension so like a thousand things came out of that that i never would have understood right and it, it, uh, it, it was like a circle strafe kind of combat game that's right. like big open spaces throw me some right. arenas yeah yeah and i think i'm definitely with you there because like there's so many things that i've learned conceptually but then had to make the mistake anyway to like yeah. actually learn it because like i i watched that gdc talk but then like i had to do the mistake anyway to like get it but then right. once you get it it kind of like you said with the new tools once you get the hammer then it looks like a nail because because now you it's not just a thing that you read it's like a thing that you understand and your perspective shifts that's yeah. the thing is you can like you can gain the knowledge without shifting your perspective but when that perspective shifts it opens up kind of a different like just like your eyeball game how you take on a different eyeball and you see things uh from a different uh perspective in, in, in a weird way and this is almost more like a, a value thing uh it feels and maybe this is us fooling ourselves and rationalizing our failures and mistakes and time we burned or whatever but like there is this clear kind of conceptual gap between if i can successfully operate in the world by parroting things that have been memorized into me of what will be well rewarded as opposed to if I have a much deeper, richer, foundational, internal sense of how and why I'm doing what I'm doing, like, that just feels better, right? That feels more like right. I'm a, not a machine. Like, I like to know that that's why and where the boundary is, and that's why and how and where, and I can consider some variations. And where these things are also so important is, and in the case for games, absolutely, in a lot of other fields in modern technology and climate, etc., stuff is changing. Stuff is rapidly changing. The economy is changing, market's changing, how we sell things, design metrics, devices, etc. And that's where it doesn't suffice to memorize an answer that five or 10 years ago, someone figured out, here's the pattern that works. You need right. to have the actual deeper understanding because when the stuff starts changing on the surface, what you got left is your actual foundation of, okay, thrown into a new situation, I'm better equipped than somebody else. 
who is again parroting something that seemed like the right way from someone who dogmatically gave him that. It's so interesting when you, especially when you look at the mobile market and you see some of these clones, but they miss like a piece that's super important for the game because they don't understand like what made it work. It's yeah. always, I, I love downloading a bunch of mobile game clones. It's so interesting to see how they put them together. But yeah, it, 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 it was like uh, at best, it, I feel this way about it. Uh, dreams on PS4 is obviously a neat thing. Uh, and some of the things that people do with that is like I recently saw a really impressive looking Wipeout XL, you know, kind of remake kind of game. But at best, it reminds me. It's like an advertisement of, in my imagination, what that other game is like. Yeah. It is not as fun to play for reasons that are deep, right? Like, it yeah. is non-trivially, at best, a reminder of something else, an experience I had that was very different than what I'm seeing and actually interacting with. It's so interesting. Like, you'll you'll hear people literally say, oh, it's like Darkest Dungeon. It's like Binding of Isaac. Well, yeah, because that's what it's like. It's not the thing. It's like the the version of the thing but yeah, yeah. chris you got an audiobook coming out i would like to talk about that real quick i would yes. love the info on that sure yeah so the the way this has been happening uh it's uh, get yourself to do things.com get yourself to do things.com there's a little mailing list sign up there uh, that has been growing for growing for years and essentially the idea there was like i didn't know what i was calling it yet and this is a thing as to i was trying to i originally got some audience through that i'd email them on a regular basis about what are you trying to work on what kind of challenge you're running into that helped inform this process at first it was going to be a book I eventually figured out, I kept, I, I wrote two different drafts that were hundreds of pages long. And I was like, if your challenge is getting yourself to do something, I can't hand you a tome and be like, read this. And so the audiobook I realized is such a better format to like fit in while you're making breakfast before work or whatever, and just to fit it in your commute to another one. And so that audiobook is coming out soon. Uh, the title is Self Command. Uh, and it's in terms of our process of how we, how we, how we effectively essentially manage ourselves in a, in a way of thinking and a small set of practices that just help us do the thing we're meaning to do in a way that we don't wind up kicking ourselves over how we picked it or how it came out in a way that I have found helpful both for me in getting myself to make an audiobook, to make video courses, to start businesses, to start to start grad school, to quit grad school, uh, to get myself to just go the direction I wanted to go. And then in a way that I've tried to be able to adapt it. So part of the nice thing about we have an online game only club, hometeamgamedev.com. I was able to test this material with dozens of these people. And like inherent to that group, right, is that people who come to this group, there's nothing wrong with them per se, but they came to it partly because other solutions weren't working for them. Other things weren't working right. They had tutorials. They could find online videos. They could find stuff. They weren't making games. They wanted to make games. We help them do it. We help get them over those hurdles and do it. And so it was a, a prime audience to test this with. And so work throughout the material, some stories as to like some th examples of where our members find, found a variation on this work for them or an example of how they applied this sort of point about getting unstuck from a, something they're thinking about or on uh, just like, again, like non-game programming examples too. And part of why the, import, why the appeal has been so important to me has been realizing how much more universal this problem is between I want to do a thing, I have access to the information to do it, why am I not doing it? And it's, it's this thing where the internet has given us essentially infinite piles of library resources and we still aren't doing the thing. Why not? And I think that this is a missing piece for a lot of people in terms of helping get them on an exercise routine or cooking if they mean to, and they bought cookbooks and not using them. Uh, it's this kind of much more general pattern. I think that's what I've dedicated my last couple of years on YouTube to is, is the non-technical side of the creative field of game dev. That sounds awesome, dude. Um, all of those links will be down in the description. If you guys want to pick up your copy, it will be out by the time of this video goes up and uh, you can check it out. Uh, Chris, where can people find you online if they need sure. to talk to you? Yeah, so uh, name's Chris Delion, C-H-R-I-S-D-E-L-E-O-N. I'm proud to say I've pretty heavily owned the SEO of my front page if you Google me, uh, but uh, it's Chris Delion on Twitter, it's Chris Delion on Facebook, Chris Delion on LinkedIn, etc. Uh, the other thing, my company, Home Team Game Dev, all fully spelled up, Home Team Game Dev, G-A-M-E-D-E-V.com, uh, or on Twitter, Home Team Game Dev, those are my uh, training company for game development stuff. People around the world building games have practice that I help advise and mentor. Cool. Everybody check out those links down below. Uh, both his group uh, that helps hobbyists all over the world come together to make games, but also his audiobook, which is uh, how to get yourself to do things, is going to be uh, really helpful for whatever, wherever you're at in your, your journey, even creative journey, really, because this kind of transcends game dev so much, uh, the audiobook especially. Uh, but Chris, thank you so much for being here, dude. I really appreciate it. 
Thanks for making time to chat. It's been right. great. See ya, everybody. See ya.